Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and I'm your lovely hostess uh, today and always uh, for this show. <laughs> My guests like that. Um, today we're doing a show about a person who is not on the show. Um, Eric Rofus, who passed away this year and was a, um, a teacher, uh, an activist, a uh, proud sex radical, a uh, social critic, a uh, complicated man, uh, did a, some of his early work in the East Coast, then Southern California, then Northern California. Um, and I have three guests here today, all of whom knew Eric, different parts of his life, uh, and I think interacted with his um, philosophy and his work at different parts of his life. So welcome, Tori Osborne. Tori is a senior advisor to Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, the mayor of Los Angeles and longtime activist. Welcome, Tori. Glad to be here. Michael Kearns, who is an actor, activist, lots of things that start with A, <laughs> uh, advocate for everything good, um, and himself a bit of a sex radical, I guess, or at least a performer about issues of uh, sexuality, and uh, I think an interesting uh, work in that area. Um, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Sheila. Third guest, Phil Wilson. Phil is the executive director of the Black AIDS Institute. Welcome, Phil. Good to be here. Um, Tori, let's start with you. Um, how did you meet Eric, and uh, what did you know about him at the time when you met him? Do you remember? October 14th, 1979. <laughs> did you look it up? First <laughs> gay and lesbian march on Washington. Oh, sure. And um, I think it was the night before, actually. Um, there was a cultural event. Tom Robinson, glad to be gay. Mm. Um, not Kate Clinton, a little bit of a different era. Anyway, I'm not going to remember everybody who performed there. But um, and he was very much. A, I was I was working on the backstage. Robin Tyler helped produce the event. She was my partner at the time. I was kind of a a baby activist in the gay world, in the gay and lesbian world. I was actually working in women's music at the time, in sort of the lesbian, feminist, separatist world. And Eric Rofus was one of the few men at the time, certainly a few white men at the time, who kind of crossed those worlds. Uh, this was pre-AIDS. This is 1979. So I met him. Um, I mean, I just remember meeting my, I don't remember which day, but there were several events going on that week. And the, the story we share, which is a footnote, a buried footnote, it'll never appear in any history of the gay movement, but is after that march, Eric tried to start an alternative, a grassroots progressive alternative to then NGTF, National Gay Task Force, called NOLAG, National Organization of Lesbians and Gays. And for some reason, which I can't remember, they wanted the founding conference to be in Los Angeles. So mm. Eric Rofus, after I had briefly met him at this march, called me like two months later in LA, I was living in LA briefly, and um, asked if I would be like the lead organizer for the founding conference of NOLAG in, I believe, February of 1980. So Eric thought that the task force was too mainstream. It Correct. needed to have it was a, a lobbying more progressive... group. We needed, we needed a multiracial, co gender organization that did grassroots organizing. And he was living in Boston? He was in he... Boston. Yeah. He was teaching, I believe, elementary school. He'd already written two books. He was quite impressive, actually, his resume. But what was most impressive to me, and I was new to LA in 1979, was um, I just moved from San Francisco uh, down to, to be with Robin was, um, was his fluency, well first of all that he was a progressive and second of all was his fluency kind of across cultures and his comfort with, with a very progressive, you know, multiracial, co-gender vision of the world. This wasn't happening much in 1979. Mm. Trust me. I lived in San Francisco for five years and only knew one gay man, except when we would come together during the White Night Riots or, you know, mm -hmm. the, when Harvey Milk was killed. So Eric was one of these men who, who was very, who had women, people of color in his friendship networks, walked the talk and, and was very, a very interesting personality, very forthright, quite, um, he could be intimidating. Anyway, long story short, No Leg just imploded. And it was 1979, the, gay, the men's caucus, there were about 300 people from around the country at the founding conference, about half men and women actually. Um, and he, there was a men's caucus, a women's caucus, a youth caucus, and Eric and the men's caucus um, put forward a sexual freedoms resolution. 
and it exploded. It imploded the conference. The women walked out, the youth walked out. <laughs> it was like, you know, and wow. I mean, it's almost ama it, it's amazing to think of it now, but it was, it was too early for something like that in the, the marriage, the domestic partnership between men and women at the time. And well, anyway. not only that, but the sexual freedom, the, the men weren't ambivalent about it. As a matter of fact, it seemed like, at, certainly in that era before AIDS, it was an identity issue. I mean, that gay men were about sexual freedom. It, right. was a, it, was a, it was a pride about it. And a thing that the rest of the world was so uptight about, including the women, right? Totally. Well, I mean, sort of the left edge of the gay men's community were already, you know, very comfortable. I mean, this wasn't endorsing NAMBLA. You know, it wasn't that far out there, but it was a strong cross-generational, consensual, you know, you can imagine, I don't remember the wording of it, but the women <coughs> went bonkers, the feminists <laughs> went bonkers, you invited us to this, and it was, it was a, a, mech, a mess. But what I remember about it was how principled, how feminist, and how much integrity Eric had, although he was a leader of the Men's Caucus. And you know, then he went back to Boston, the thing blew up, nothing had went anywhere. No second conference for no lag. Nobody remembers the thing except for me and <laughs> Eric. Um, and uh, so anyway, he goes back to Boston, we stayed in touch with each other, and then the next thing I know, he's head of the center. He mo his moved to Los Angeles, it's 1986, and he calls you and me, you and I were together then, and says, want to play Trivial Pursuit? I need some friends. <laughs> so he says, That's Exactly and right. we began a series of monthly evenings with Eric, uh, new to Los Angeles, didn't know a lot of people, but he knew me, and then I was with you, and you, and I, and he, and David Mixner, and a few other... <laughs> Played Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> that, that was 1986. It's great that the 80s are coming that was back, it. too, not just the 70s. <laughs> so then in 1987, he hired me to be finance director at the center, um, and at the time, he... You know, he didn't say it to me then, but he said it shortly afterwards, that he really hired me, he hoped to groom me to be his successor, which in fact was what happened. He was at the center as executive director from 85 to 88 and really began the transformation of the center. He was very comfortable, you know, again, moving across worlds, and he was extremely comfortable, hired strong feminist women, hired three or four strongly feminist-identified women, started hiring people of color in large, you know, in larger numbers started to really change the center, the culture of the center, did an affirmative action plan, began what I then kind of concluded in my era, but he was, and he was my management mentor, but so those were the years that he was in Los Angeles, 85 to 88. So what was your experience with him? It, it, I mean, some people have said there's this sort of dichotomy. Here he's running the center, and the center was, again, seen as kind of a, I don't know, kind of the mainstream social services agency. Exactly, the mainstream AIDS agency. And kind he of. didn't think of himself as mainstream. No. He was a leather guy, <laughs> you know, and he. I'm proud. A, a proud, really proud. And <clears throat> there must have been, I don't know, did you see any dichotomy in terms of that? I mean, the women started waking up to sex too, I mean, which was. A, a new thing for the left. Look, I mean, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have a conversation about sex radicalism, <clears throat> but the reality was, as executive director of the center, he was, um, he was my management mentor. He mm -hmm. taught me how to manage. He took very seriously building professional skill sets and sharing them with other people. I, it was only later, during when he left the center, that I interacted with him uh, more kind of philosophically. He was extremely politically, he actually started with Chris Brownlee. He started mm. this little gathering of gay kind of organizers and leaders that then I institutionalized, became the monthly leadership roundtable when I took over. He was, he took very, remember this guy was 32 years old when he became executive director of the center. I mean, it just blows my yeah. mind when I think of it now. He took it very seriously. He knew that the center was an important institution. He didn't, he didn't live at the edge. He lived in many parts of the jigsaw puzzle of a movement or of a community. And, and didn't, you know, he stood on the ground of being, he was proud to be an executive director, proud to be a manager, proud to be a fundraiser, proud to be all those kind of professional skills, but always was, mo saw the, we, we, he, he instituted an orientation for new staff at the center. And I'll never forget it because he talked about the history. 
he, he really believed in building social movements. I mean, and, and about, and the culture. He wanted the center to always retain its, he didn't call it progressive, his social justice oriented mm -hmm. culture, the social movement oriented. We are organizers, we may be service providers, but we are organizers, we are advocates. He carried with him that kind of radical spirit of organizing or reform spirit or whatever you want to call it. He, he was very um, strong about sex positive. I mean, that would have been the language he would have used in mm -hmm. that time, would have been sex positive messages around HIV AIDS. He would never have denied he was a leather guy or something, but he wasn't wearing leather to board meetings. You know, <laughs> he, he wasn't about making agitational statements. And I say that with due respect because that was one of his strengths was he, the ground he stood on, he claimed very fully. Look, the guy was a mountain of a man. He was a big, sometimes intimidating, hairy guy. He had a big old beard, a lot of hair, and he could be intimidating to lots of people. But he, he, he used his power mm -hmm. in service of always mentoring younger people, mentoring women, sharing his power, building a movement. Somebody wrote this on, on when he died, that he was a mountain of a man. And it's like losing him was like a mountain you're used to seeing out of your window, be mm -hmm. having in your life on a daily basis, and suddenly it's gone. It's almost inconceivable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still inconceivable to me that Eric Rofus is, is gone in some weird way. He was huge. Um, so, but but I, I, I know, I've seen his books, I've read the articles. You know, he was a, he was a machine of a writer. <laughs> yeah. He always read, he was always reading five magazines, four articles. He was an intellectual, but a people's intellectual or mm -hmm. a populist well, intellectual. But he wanted to explain, too. Mm. Yes, and I a mean, social it wasn't critic. just, because he was a teacher. Constantly and I mean, not just in his profession, but you know, some people sort of have that in them. Now, Phil, when did you meet him? Well, it's actually funny because I think I met Eric at the same time I actually met Tory. It was during the No Oil LaRouche campaign. Uh -huh. uh, I came out in 1980, and then we, Chris and I moved uh, to Los Angeles in 1982. This is Chris Brownlee that uh, Tory right, was talking about, Chris and I right? uh, uh, were talking. partners, and, and so uh, he wanted to come to Los Angeles, so we moved to Los Angeles in 1982, and I had been involved primarily in Black and White Men Together, and Chris and I were building a successful business, and then the LaRouche Initiative hit. And, um, 1986. That's right, 1986. And Chris Rowling and Michael Weinstein and I were part of the left fringe of the, the Noah LaRouche initiative. We were part of an organization called Stop LaRouche that was kind of Silver Lake based. And as was the way in those days, I kind of acted as, as the, the, the moderate or, or the liaison. <laughs> and, uh, and as a result of that, I was kind of dispatched to be one of the people that was involved in the Noah LaRouche campaign, which uh, and no one in 86. Right, no one in 86. You were known, LaRouche. We were known, right, exactly. <laughs> That's when I met you. That's right, exactly. That's when I met you initially. <laughs> and, and so um, <clears throat> doing that process, uh, and obviously the center was, was involved. And prior to that, uh, Black and White Men Together had their weekly uh, rap groups at the center, and, and I was the facilitator at that time. And so after the Rouge campaign, or maybe it wasn't even over yet, Eric called me up and he says, Phil, how would you like to do the most exciting AIDS work in the country. And I said, well, it must not pay anything. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why do you say that? And I said, because if it paid anything, it wouldn't have to be the most exciting work <laughs> in the country. You only have to introduce it that way <laughs> if there's no payment. And what's very, very funny, he talked me into taking that job. Now, at the time, Chris and I actually owned what was beginning to be a successful business. It was called Black is More Than Beautiful uh, at the time. But he, Chris was starting to get sick. And so I called my mother and I said, we're going to close the business and I'm going to take this job at the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center um, and um, doing, working on this project called Stop AIDS. And my mother said, fine and what have you. And she said, well, how much does it pay? And so I told her, and she said, oh, okay. And she said, well, what else are you going to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> so she thought it was a part-time job. That was the Stop AIDS. Uh, huh? Stop AIDS project. It was Stop AIDS, right, the Stop AIDS project, Stop AIDS Los Angeles. Uh, and so uh, I said, no, it's a full-time job. And so my mother hung up, and about an hour later, she called back, and she said, you know, you didn't have to go to college to earn that kind of a salary. This is not a very good return on the investment. What was it, $30,000 or something? 
No, it too. was fourteen thousand dollars in it that was 14, year. Fourteen thousand oh dollars is what it was, and it was it was half of our mortgage actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we didn't have, we had no idea how we were going to make that happen, but he. He convinced me to take that job. And it was at a time when, and as Tori said, Eric was trying to put together uh, the center as a new entity. And I actually viewed him as a part of the you know, conservative, uh, simulationist, you know, traditional part of the gay and lesbian movement. And um, so it was interesting to come to work for him. And we, we opened up a stop base office in West Hollywood. And during that time, Eric had, was on this mission that every project at the center um, had to have the center logo. Now, prior to that, each, each project, actual program, would get their own money and kind of operated as kind of this loose co co confederation of activities at the center. And so I was in charge of, of outreach and promotions for uh, Stop Bases. I developed a newsletter and the logo and all the media materials. And, um, uh, and we developed actually one of the most consistent newsletters from the center. And so every, every month our newsletter would come out. We have these ads and what have you. And Eric would call us every time something, would call me every time something would come out and says, Phil, where's the center's logo? Great, but where's the center's logo? <laughs> and I would say, uh, well, we missed it this time. We'll get it no, next month. Because we were trying to distance ourselves away from the center because <laughs> this was on the, on the heels of you know, all the various explosions. You know, Eric was the first ED after Steve Schulte, after the, the the, the, the women walked the, the out. The women walking out and all that kind of stuff. But what was interesting about Eric is that although he stood in that place, as Tori said, that actually wasn't who he was. And in fact, you know, he was, you know, a proud sex radical even even then, you know, and I remember going to Northern California to, to a meeting and it was during the same weekend as one of the festivals. Now, mind you, I was still kind of somewhat in the coming out process and I remember Eric walking in the parade, not in the parade, in the festival uh, and taking off his shirt, and, which is something I would never do. In fact, something I probably wouldn't do now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but taking off his shirt and my thinking, how can the executive director of the, of the center do that? But it's all a part of the complexities of, uh, of who he was, you know, and he, and Tori was right, he was a great, great educator and a teacher on management and, and, uh, and being thoughtful and all of those things. Well, and this was also in these days, or maybe it was just before that, when it seemed like all of the, the, the gay male leadership in the community was sick. That's right. I mean, so many, uh, you know, of our, of our guys were sick, and people were, I, it seemed to me, I remember, people were thinking what, what, what's going to ever happen That's right. to the gay movement because it looked like everybody was going to be gone. Well, we were, we were literally you know, fighting for our lives and, and every one of us was looking at each other wondering who's going to be next, next you know, and, and wondering you know, who was going to be, if you will, the last man standing. Uh, and, 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 and in, the, in the beginning, as a matter of fact, you know, the, 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 the Proposition 64 happened on the heels of the HIV test. So mm -hmm. prior to then, mm -hmm. we didn't know who was positive and who wasn't. Because mm -hmm. you, know, you basically got introduced to someone when they had full-blown AIDS, when they were basically six or seven or eight weeks away from death, as, mm -hmm. it, as it turned out. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very, very extremely intense time. And so we were fighting for identity in all sorts mm -hmm. of of ways because it was really our last stand and so every single thing you felt you felt it passionately and anyone who didn't think the way you thought was the enemy you know and so that's kind of the way that, that the way that life was well and also there was so much denial I mean there was denial in the community there was denial the government wouldn't even utter the word you know we remember the, when Reagan somebody said here's a president you know with this all going on and never once has he even said the word so it was a it was a struggle and kind of a, 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 a you know a, a, a community struggle. Nobody else. And Eric actually moved the center into AIDS work. What people yes. don't remember is that the That's Carposi right. Sarcoma Foundation, which turned into the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, came down to the center, came down to Los Angeles when Steve Schulte was there to say, mm. "You need to start an AIDS organization." And the center refused. The center would not do it. And it wasn't until Eric came on board and Stop AIDS Los Angeles was the first AIDS program that the center did. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that grew a whole host of, I mean, not out of Stop AIDS, but at, around that time grew all of the things. I mean, back then, the, 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 the center, the, the health department at the center was still very much STD. 
you right. know, which was actually kind of the, 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 the health component that the center did. And to move the center and to, to kind of be front and center as an AIDS organization, though, that was really, he planted those seeds. The other thing he did, if I can just say one thing during that time, was he wasn't afraid to truth tell about the impact on people's lives mm -hmm. at, in an organization like the center. At that, during those years, we were losing to mm -hmm. AIDS a staff person a month yeah. on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. All of us were going to the hospital every night and we were going to funerals at least once a week. And remember Eric, I'm sure you were there during this time, called these, every time somebody died, he would call a staff meeting. This was very controversial mm. because mm -hmm. people tend to grieve privately and creating public ritual hadn't yet hit. The quilt wasn't around then, you know. Mm -hmm. And he just forced people to walk into it. He was not afraid of the psychology and the sort of spiritual and cultural and communal impacts of it. Well, and I think that also had something to do, I mean, when later when he was, uh, he was always <coughs> writing, as you said, very prolific, but he was writing about that, about let's be honest. And grief. You know, about about grief and it wasn't just well I just lost a friend well it's also no accident that sex and death are entwined in some way and I think that he made that mm. perfectly clear I mean his his ability to confront or embrace or look at death was prof as profound as his connections to a sexual identity I also find when as you as all of you were talking just about his largesse in terms of even throughout knowing he was HIV negative, mm -hmm. he still behaved with the mandate and the mission and the passion of those of us who then later found out that we were. So there's some great irony. I mean, it's mm -hmm. almost as if he had a prescient tr sense of his own mortality. He certainly behaved as if. I mean, I never had the sense when I would meet with him or talk with him that he was separating himself from me in any way, shape, or form. And in spite of people's varying degrees of ev evolution, a lot of times it just it's in the room mm -hmm. with you when you're having a meeting with someone who's HIV negative and you're HIV positive. I never sensed that. I always sensed that he was as vulnerable about life and as, you know, uh, whatever the words are. So. Well, well, he was one of those people that really understood very early on, you know, that we actually were all in this together. Mm. You know, that, that some of us were going to die, yes. Now, and, but in fact, all of us were suffering in this, you know, and that the enormous pain and grief exactly. coming from losing people at those numbers, you know, for, for example, the, the, the Stop AIDS team that Eric hired, I am the only man on that team mm. that is still alive. Mm -hmm. The only one. All the rest of those guys are dead. You know, and, and if you look at the, the male staff, at the center uh, in, in 1986. Mm. Uh, there are very, very, very few of us uh, that, that are alive. And yet, Eric, in the midst of that, you know, we had work to do. You know, and, and he created an environment that you never, ever forgot that th th that work had, had, had to happen, no, no matter what. I mean, I, I did a campaign while I was at Stop AIDS that a number of years later, maybe even a full 15 years later, an agency in St. Louis tried to do a similar campaign, and the ED was fired. And then I had this idea of getting porn stars mm. to be spokespeople you know, to fight AIDS. And so I called these porn stars, and we did an ad campaign mm -hmm. you know, in Frontiers and, uh, and the news back then you know, with these porn stars you know, and saying that you, know, you have to protect yourself. You know, Eric was like right there, mm -hmm. you know, the, the entire way. Michael, how did you know him? Well, I knew him um, when he was the ED at the center and I was working as an actor and producing and doing a lot of AIDS related work that didn't shy away from issues of sexuality. And you know, when I thought back of it as today and in the past couple of days knowing I was going to do this, we really kind of had we did have a friendship, but it was almost like working lunches, <laughs> where even though what we were talking about, uh, you know, bonded us in a certain man, mano a mano way because of the shared grief and pain and everything, we were really kind of working things out, like what is this about? And I learned a lot from him. I mean, his just his ability to. Um, understand beyond the, the, the quick just say no 
sort of mentality and to look at everyone's individual sexuality and not sort of clump everyone together and he had a profound respect for that I mean I think that it, interesting that you said the, the dichotomy I think the dichotomy with Eric was not that he was uh, Leatherman by night and ED by day it's just that he was honest about it <laughs> <laughs> I mean there are a lot of them honey <laughs> he just told the truth I mean it's but it's really it's it is the truth mm -hmm. he wasn't ashamed he's he was not shame based and we know where that shame based um, judgment in terms of education in terms of arts and it's interesting because the theater you know it, it provides a different avenue into these issues and he respected that in the theater nobody was afraid to talk about sexuality or to really I mean in AIDS us which was done in 84 85 people were literally dying on the stage and telling jokes about their sex life mm -hmm. and Eric got that and got the importance of humor as part of the lesson that you know you weren't just going to put out all these uh, posters that scared you that you had to approach things more humanistically and not demonizing you know he was way ahead of his time I mean I think that he was truly a visionary in terms of what's coming down now mm -hmm. and what we're dealing with in this decade of crystal methamphetamine use and 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 the breakdown of, of gay male sexuality the distortion of it and I don't mean distortion wearing leather I mean distortion in inability to connect mm -hmm. you know I think he saw all that coming I really do well, he certainly thought about it, too. And it must have been a very, I mean, I, I had not thought about it at the time. But learning more later, as I think the women did, as we became more involved with the guys going through this, that, you know, the, the, the story of gay male sexuality was about freedom Absolutely. and experimentation and just, you know, pushing the envelope or whatever you, the, you know, whatever you would say. That's what it was about. And some people were very, very critical about that. But then with AIDS, everything became very confused or confusing. What was the community about? Now it was gonna be about death and, and or surviving or grieving or whatever. I mean, he did write as well about survivor's guilt when you were talking about his being negative and other, you know, working with people and talking to people and being friends with people who were positive but still he he identified that kind of i don't know psychology in the community did you it was that part because you worked some of that into your own Shows. Well, it's interesting because now those of us who've lived this long are experiencing survivor guilt in a different way than huh. he was experiencing survivor guilt. I mean, it just keeps transforming itself. Um, you know, what you say, I mean, here's what how I see it. I mean, we spent the 70s saying we're sexy, we're hot. We're going to kiss, we're going to hold hands, we're going to walk down the street, we're going to have all kinds of sex imaginable, and we're going to laugh and love and go crazy for each other, and this is who we are, you better accept us. Then wham, hide it, get rid of it, put a condom on it. Don't let us know what you do in bed. You're bad. You're the, you know, Jim Peter used to say the good homosexual. You know, it gave the good homosexual a chance to show, you know, well, I didn't do any of that. I mean, I remember in the nascent days of AIDS, 82 or something, oh, it's those leather queens mm -hmm. who are getting it. Mm -hmm. Or it's those poppers, the ones, who, I mean, there were these ridiculous. The, the athletes, the guys at Fire Island, uh, the, the oh, blacks, it was always. Yeah, blacks, that else. was absolutely. But it was all these separating devices, lines of demarcation. And, you know, what? if you, you used to be a sexual hero and a revolutionary, and then you were a sick freak mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overnight, all your, you know, it was political. Mm -hmm. Sex was political in the 70s. Mm -hmm. It was an identity, it was a form, it was the formation of our identity. Suddenly it's, it, 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 and now look at it. I mean, now it's so, we're like in a, you know, horror mirrors of, you know, all these distortions and, and the drug use and the, of course, the technology doesn't help things. And, and the fact that, you know, people are, are not looking in each other's eyes anymore. Hmm. It, it's, it's just, um, 
Talk you know, a little more about that. Process. Talk a little bit more about how you see it now. Yeah, what distort? Talk about the distortion because yeah, we haven't actually done a show. Although I've been <laughs> told by I think all of you, I should do a show on the crystal meth use in the community and the you know the epidemic. Well, you know, of I just it. did a piece on that and. I think that a theater piece. You mean. Yeah, a theater yeah. piece called the Tina Dance. First person interviews, not unlike the work I did around mm -hmm. AIDS in the early days, to try to not to get the demonization element out and look at the human. What, what is? It's just very easy to say. Oh, stop doing crystal meth, and oh, why are these sick freaks doing this crystal meth and having sex all night? That's the easy way out. Why, indeed? Let's really ask why. Well, for a variety of reasons, including survivor guilt, including grief, including inability to launch into another real relationship, so I'll have a relationship that's drug-induced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to recapture that sexuality without the sexuality of the 70s without the guilt of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the one thing that you constantly hear about crystal methamphetamine, is it unleashes mm -hmm. feelings of shame and guilt. That shame and guilt that we worked so hard to conquer came back in such a devastating way that well, it's part, very difficult. Part of it is, is the technology, and I think that the, the crystal meth phenomenon has grown out of two places. I think part it has grown out of kind of the guilt and kind of what happens. I think all along, I mean, Stop AIDS, for example, was about envisioning a world without AIDS. You know? mm. And all of our, our prevention strategies for gay men was about hold on until we get through this. You know, <laughs> uh, all the sexual, the cultural changes around sexual behavior was about hold on until we get through this. But what happens when all of a sudden you say, we're not going to get through this. That's right. This is it, folks. You know, and so, quite frankly, all of the sacrifice that you were making, you know, hoping to survive to the day when this would be over, well, this is now it, you know. And so what happens to those folks when, when, when that reality happens? And then the second thing that happens, because Chris, crystal meth is, is interesting in, in the cross-generational reality of it, and then among young people, who, or people who are actually coming to sexual, their sexuality in an age where a lot of the stuff that created community, kind of the community that's created by oppression and, and needing to come together, does isn't there. And then the, the, the technology and way in which people hook up. I mean, the thing about the 70s and the early 80s is that we met in, in, in bars and we met in bathhouses. And no matter what else people thought about, they created communities. That's right. Because Absolutely. They, they were their families. You know, and I know when, when I came out, there was kind of this whole process of, well, let's hurry up and and, and, and have sex and get it out of the way because we then we'll become talk. lifelong friends. That's, That's right. right. That's right. And, and, and my friend Reggie used to call me uh, your bristers, your brothers and your sisters and, and whatever. But it was about creating family. And now what happens is that we're not we're not creating families in those in those settings. And so you have these these folks who have no sense of family and community and are just t so disjointed, you know, and, and so alone and, and are feeling this kind of pain. And, and, and the role models or the folks who can can provide mentoring you know, we're all reeling from not having a chance to kind of deal with kind of the process of bereavement, bereavement and grieving and moving on. But I know. think one of the things that, and, and Tori, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm thinking about when the women were still kind of separate from this, and as you said, kind of critical of some of it, it was, it was thought about gay men in the 70s that they were also very impersonal. That's what it looked like from the outside, that having sort of impersonal sex. I mean, it's interesting to me what you say, Michael, no one even looks each other in the eye anymore. In but, those days, it might have been fast and anonymous, but we looked at each other in the eyes. <laughs> but it wasn't anonymous, Michael, ne because the point, necessarily. The, point, the point is that the, 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 the first encounter may have been, may have been anonymous and fast, but the point is that those guys were going to the bathhouses week Seeing after each week other, after week. The same now, there was a network that was happening. That's right. Or in the bars, you know, where, where would you go on Mondays or where would you go on Wednesday? Where you go? It was the same folks there. You know, and Where so it, now it's quantity. And the same quantity. folks who developed the community response to AIDS. Sure. That's the right. Same it's people. And in the fact, same people. I think somebody's done a sort of anthropological study of the people who were the most active engaged in San Francisco in the bar scene and the bathhouse scene. 
then became literally that was the network, the infrastructure that became the folks that came together. Well, they were the ones who did the initial fundraisers. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's it's logical, but it's it's a kind of a, you know, people don't think that way. They objectify. They separate. They impose all these kind of you know well, ridiculous I think that's categories. A, part of what Eric wrote about right. was that sex is not separate from the rest of life, right. and that the critique from the outside of the community was that we were all about sex, but it was separate from life. And therefore, we were separate from life, right. you know? But I think what he said was, no, pleasure is really, it's a good thing, right. and it's part of your life. Try to figure out your identity as a whole human being, including this stuff. That's right. Um, and I think that's what he tried to, what he did, write about and sort of succeed. So you're saying, really, the younger generation doesn't see themselves holistically this way as you see them. I don't think they have a chance to on some level. Because Yet, of this darn internet stuff? Well, I think, no. that, I think the electronic... The world is breaking down. The, the, world, the whole entire world. <laughs> the entire world is but crashing. But also the other rapidly. interesting thing, I mean, I think that our human needs are the same. I mean, the thing that came up every single conversation I had with anyone who had used crystal methamphetamine, eventually, if you could distill it into a word, what are you trying to do? The word was connect. Mm -hmm. But guess what? There are deliberately on disconnect in order to connect. Mm -hmm. Well, this isn't only true of gay people in Los Angeles. <laughs> right. This is true of a nation and a world, you know. I mean, we're so disconnected and only connected to our blackberries and Botox treatments and a <laughs> while. And, and we, live in a, we live in a world where, you know, at least in, in this government, in this society, where we have a government infrastructure that's designed to disconnect, mm -hmm. uh, is, is designed that's to divide, right. you know, is the politics of divide and to create others all over the place. Well, and also to create a kind of self-hatred as well. I mean, Absolutely. The government, the, the federal government, in hating so many different groups of people, right. has essentially said, and you really ought to hate yourselves as well, because you're right. not worthy, you're not worthy, and you're not worthy, and you know, you're not the worthy. The politics of hate are impossible not to internalize, especially in your vulnerable moments of your life, or if you're young and unformed. I mean, even the most healthy person has to be affected by what's going on in the world. And a lot of times that manifests sexually. Right. It might Manif not manifest in the office place or in the right. workplace mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, in your friendship. But when it, behind closed doors, sometimes that's when that behavior manifests. And, and, it, and is it really a surprise that given the world we live in today that there is an increase in the number of people who want to create a different reality and that's what crystal meth is? is does that really surprise us? Now, do we, does it really surprise us when we have a, a, a president you know, that is willing to change the Constitution of the United States to say that there, there are some people who deserve full rights and there are some people who don't? You know, and, and, and torture is and, good. Right. And, right. And, 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 and torture is, is good. Now, that there are people who want to say, you know, I need to find another place to be. <laughs> and if I can't find another physical place to be, then I can find another the psychological place to be. Is, is that really so surprising? It makes complete and utter sense. It's sort of the other side of the same coin is the huge outpouring of spiritual seeking, mm -hmm. whether it's traditional religious. The, the, the rise of religious fundamentalism, Islam, Christ, Hindu, Christian, on the other side. I mean, what is the difference? It's exactly the same thing, you know? It's, it's craziness, it's social. $250 million a day on the war in Iraq. I mean, the statistic goes over and over in my head in this kind of weird, you know, perseverating way. It's like, and I mean, it's insane, truly. The world is insane. Why wouldn't you wanna go off and and then factor into that all the loss, all the grief, right. all the messages about gay marriage and all the evangelicals and all the, I mean, there's a lot out there that's saying <laughs> you're not okay. Well, and, and also <laughs> guilt is a, is a very easy place to go. Speaking as the um, product of a, a marriage of a Jew and a Catholic, uh, uh, we were, I mean. You have both you guilt just, and shame. I have guilt and shame and guilt. And uh, then there's and guilt. bagels. <laughs> Bagels, but the bagels were good. Um, it's 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 really a question, and I guess um, Eric's work and his life is, uh, as I said to you, is probably going to be a jumping-off place for us because when we get together, we just 
talk and talk and talk about whatever comes up, which it was, which is great. But it, it had to do with integration in a way, I think. You know, not just your sexuality with the rest of your life, but you're really talking about a fractured society that leads to fractured individuals, where people are trying to figure out who they are as a unit, but it's very difficult. They're, they're you know, separating much of what they do here from what they do here. And I think, as you said, it wasn't about Eric being a leather guy by night and an ED by day. He, he said, well, I think he had this fierce and probing intelligence and this fierce need. I mean, he had a need to be active, to be an activist, to organize, to, to I mean, he was always organizing some network. I mean, I can't even remember the most recent one always organizing mm -hmm. something, creating something. He had a creative drive, uh, you know, writing, figuring out um, an intellectual, he was an intellectual, you know, in, in a way. Um, you know, I wanted to, to mention the last time that I saw him, I taught a course a couple of years ago on community activism and public policy at UCLA, and I thought, well, who do I know who's been a professor because I'd never done it before? And so I called Eric up, and he was so generous with his time. He sent me all his curriculum. Now, he was teaching education up at University of Humboldt, Humboldt I think right. it was. Um, so he was teaching an edu he was teaching teachers to be really, and not just gay and lesbian curriculum, but all kinds of pedagogy and stuff that was you know way beyond my ken. But uh, but he shared with me like how you teach. Mm. He literally and he came down to L.A. and we spent a couple of hours together, and it was the same. You know, it was the, he he had been my mentor. He literally taught me how to manage everything I teach when I do my executive director seminars for young executive directors about how you manage you know, one-on-ones with your direct reports and, you know, all this kind of basic management one-on-one I got from Eric Rofus, and here he was teaching me how to be a teacher uh, again. And I, I just, I wanted him to know that I remembered that. So I would put that out into the, into the universe. But um, I think, and the reason I said about this fierce probing intellect is that I think he was much more comfortable with dichotomies, with complexities, with the multiple facets, with multitudes, um, with a world that has complexity and where everything doesn't resolve itself in a simple way. At the same time as I think, you know, when we talk about the breakdown of community, um, I think he, he and all of us who have experienced community and the healing power of it and the um, political power of it uh, feel how intensely it is missing in the world today. Uh, it, it's, there's a grief about that in and of itself. So he understood the times we lived in. He, was not, he understood completely what we were up against, but he didn't need to make it all fit into some you know, worldview or ideology or, or mm -hmm. feminist, you know, or, or some, do you know what I'm saying? And I think that yeah, is I was, rare. I think people try to resolve the contradictions well, into Well, it's interesting simple. because we have sort of about the way we feel about gayness and AIDSness and the, the connection. We've gone through these different phases too, and probably not uh, even the four of us at the same time, right. where okay. AIDS was a gay disease. And then we thought, well, no, it's not. And everyone ought to know that it's not because it kind of it's stigmatizing our community and it's also dangerous in other communities that are not dealing with it. So then we went into AIDS is not just, you know, a gay disease. And so we de-gayed AIDS. Then Eric convened a male health summit, gay male health summit, I think in Boulder was the first one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then Phil and I were having this conversation about how, well, you should probably say what, what you said about this notion of gay men's health without it well, being well, about know, AIDS. That, that Eric was evolving over time, and Eric actually was one of the, was one of the leaders of the discussion on the de-gaying of AIDS and resisting the de-gaying of AIDS. And then kind of his, ne his next manifestation was about you know, developing this gay men's health. And for a lot of us, and I, and I think actually strategically in the beginning, it was the discussion about health 
outside of the AIDS paradigm. And, and for those of us who were so very much right. inside the AIDS paradigm, and particularly, and I'll just take ownership, you know, as, as a black gay man dealing with AIDS at the time, you know, there, you know, I certainly felt a sense of abandonment by that whole movement, you know, in that, you know, while AIDS, there have been some successes made of, in AIDS among white gay men, and while we didn't feel like we shared those successes among black gay men, and now, you know, there was a group of men, kind of in the same way that Tori talked about the, the earlier thing, uh, with with the conference now now there is this group these are a group of men who wanted to talk about you know, gay men's health to the exclusion mm. of HIV and AIDS you know and, and while I don't think that that was their intent and I don't want to put that on, on on them but that certainly is the way we felt about about that and, and as that movement grew it became you know, it, it became more mature and able to kind of be to include more about the AIDS discussion within a larger health discourse but that was part of kind of the the, 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 the evolution and I think that what it spoke to for me about Eric and what, why I always remember him and think about him is that he was a very, very complicated person you know, and, 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 and in a reductionist world. Mm. You know, right. and, and, and he was constantly fighting against <coughs> that reductionism. You mm -hmm. know, and, and if you kind of track the trajectory of his life and his work, you know, there was kind of a constant place where he was becoming uncomfortable with where he was. Mm. I think by the time he left the center, he was very ready to leave the center. The center was no longer a place where he was comfortable being wow. because he was evolving, you know, and then the work he did in, in San Francisco. And then I think even, you know, he, he had even transitioned out of, you know, certainly out of being the central figure in the game as health work. You know, uh, and, and I think that all of that is about, you know, life is complicated and we are complicated. And if you're going to embrace that complexity, you know, it creates a tremendous amount of discomfort among other people. Hmm. I also, I think that it, absolutely. I mean, it's so true what everyone's saying. And <clears throat> Tori emphasized, which is un indisputable, his intellectual component, but also keep in mind that he was going to lunch with me to talk about the artistic element. So not only did he have this ferocious intellect, he also had something humanistic that went with that. We know a lot of intellectuals <laughs> who would never get down in the mud, as it were, humanistically as he did. So he, and you could call this male and female in, 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 you know, in sort of stereotypical terms. I mean, you know, here he was, this white male, <clears throat> but he also had this soul and spirit of an artist in a certain way. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he, his intellectualism was not stifled in any way by fear. Well, and also, camouflage. that was also the way he reached out exactly. to communities. I mean, there was something, it's just, vaguely in my mind about reaching out to the Latino community through food stuff, through cultural food fair Brilliant. kinds of things. That it was music. If it was music, they do it around music. If it was food, he did it around food. There was, there was a, so one, in one of the writings about him, of which there are many now on the internet, I saw today, that it was an interesting, inventive way that he reached out or you know thought of inclusion uh, i wish i knew more about it because it sounded very interesting to me but the thought just what you're saying michael that the intellectual part of him was also um Nurture. it was like let's go to where people are in terms of what they're kind of about oh. he's pretty fearless yes he was one of the most fearless. fearless people i've ever met a truth teller and yet, I think... And he could be a pain in the butt. Let's just be <laughs> real. My, you know, I don't know if you were at the staff meeting. I, I think you were at the staff meeting the day that he was... This is like 1987. <laughs> and he, we would have these 200 staff people come together, you know, once a month. And he would run it like he ran his kindergarten class or his third grade class. And Gabe Crooks walks in five minutes late. He says, Gabe Crooks, you were tardy again today. And I'm like, <laughs> Phil and I are rolling eyeballs at each other. Give us a break. So, Gold so, stars. So, so our truth-telling intellectual giant of a man could be like a prissy little Cassidy. school teacher too. Right. Right? And it was actually very funny. And Tori's absolutely right because he would do those things, and yet he would 
they'll hire and invite people though who under no circumstances were going to tolerate that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, and, and you know, like, like he would call me every week and it was like, no, I'm not changing I'm not gonna tell you this, but no, I'm not changing my program. Well you know there is something about a really a great leader that has an idea and has a vision and yet will hire people that they know are going to argue with them or have their own vision or whatever. You have to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's I love that Antonio has done that, for instance. He hires people that have their own ideas about things, and Lincoln it's very difficult. It. <laughs> yes, Lincoln did it too. Right. Beautifully. <laughs> well, I, I wonder, though, for, you know, for today, um, if we see that kind of leadership uh, in the community, it's hard to talk about kind of leadership because each, you know, each of us is, we, we're not solely kind of working, being, you know, developing program necessarily in what's called the gay and lesbian community. And the thing about Eric is he would have the idea sort of about the next thing. That's right. And kind of, you know, go for it. So do you see this happening? I now? think it's a much tougher era, I gotta tell you. Yeah. I mean, I think we're in an era of reductionist thinking of right wing, of war, uh, just the context, it's very conservative. The political space is like this. Now this may change uh, in the years to come, I pray that it does. But so what that does is it will marginalize people who have that kind of energy. I mean, yeah, I mean, he couldn't have lived anywhere but San Francisco, really. San Francisco has, is such a countercultural community. It would have been tough for Eric Rofus to be Eric Rofus today in Los Angeles. I mean, I just believe that. There was also the issue of whether or not AIDS is a, still a crisis right. and whether you can sort of get people, you know, to pay attention and to organize. Mm -hmm. To be organized about around what? Anything. Yeah. But I mean, in our community, it wasn't just an organizing tool that, you know, that we were all now drawn into to work about this. But I can't even remember what the sort of what the conflict was, but there there was a conflict about, you know, whether you keep referring to AIDS as a crisis so that you can keep organizing or, you know, whether well, part of it, hmm. part of it is that that if it continues to be a crisis, then you don't have space or motivation to develop the medium range and long term goals and objectives. And so you lose an opportunity to actually end the epidemic. You know, because in a crisis, basically, you just do, you're just you doing triage. That's all you have time to do. And, and that is a source of, of a debate. You know? and, and that doesn't mean that, you, that there's not a tremendous need for a sense of urgency, because there is a tremendous need for a sense of urgency. But at the same time, I think that we have to be willing to be strategic, uh, and we have to be willing uh, to kind of bear the heaviness that comes when knowing every decision you make to do something is a decision you make to not to do something else. Mm. And so every moment I invest in basically ending the epidemic or preventing new people from entering into the epidemic, Part of that is time taken away from caring for those folks who are still in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it is a terrible Do you feel Sophie's as if choice. you're always triaging? I don't feel like I'm always triaging anymore, but I feel like it's a choice to decide not to be triaging. I certainly could be triaging and. all the time and only triaging. And that could take up more time than I have if I chose to do that. And so, so I know that there, there no, I, and basically the bottom line is that that there are people who are not going to get what they need you know, because they need it right now uh, because we have to invest some time in making sure that we're looking down the road. Hmm. I think also what Eric warned against was sort of the addiction to crisis, hmm. the adrenaline, I mean, which we become used to as kids. You know, we become sort of addicted to everything being wacky and out of, and, and, and that's what we did for all those years. I mean, we were very good at going from one hospital to the next, to the memorial, to the, and then suddenly when that tapered off, who, are, who am I? Mm -hmm. 
He, you know what that reminds me? He turned me on to Ann Wilson Schaaf's books, which really were formative in my life. The Addictive Organization, The Addictive Society, the use of addiction, and, and he and I were both recovering addicts and shared that, and, and the use of addiction as a metaphor in all kinds of ways, right. and how it played out in culture. In, in He was fascinated by the culture of organizations. I completely forgot this whole piece of him, whether it was the center, whether it was an aid service organization, whether the, the way that different dysfunctions played out, codependency, addiction. Exactly. I mean, he was completely fascinated by how psychology and various, uh, but the notion that, that the culture of activism, for example, could become addicted to crisis and self-perpetuate a dysfunctional culture. The fact that our oppression, right. you mentioned this earlier, that our own oppression could become a sickness. Habitual. Phil used that phrase, sort of institutionalized that phrase, oppression, sickness, mm -hmm. that, our, that we could externalize in our own organizations, communities, and relationships the issues that we dealt with. All that stuff, you know, was currency. We talked about it all the time in those days. Um, when we had a kind of, when we had a movement in a community where we were creating an alternative as we were living in the old world, in a sense. Um, and Eric was a, was a, a na was a, was a guide, a pilot as we navigated all those kind Pioneer. of interesting discussions that I don't find I have so much anymore. Maybe we I'm don't. isolated. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I'm isolated too. <laughs> I have them when I come on your show. <laughs> well, it's one of the Thanks reasons God. why I say, you know, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but let's have Tori and Michael and Phil on the show mm -hmm. because we, I, I think that, and Eric would have loved it. I was thinking about yeah. that today, you know. Too bad he was up north because he could have been on this show. Not that it's the best intellectual exercise in the world, but I certainly love it. But it was like that. I mean, he didn't intellectualize his life, but he could stimulate a, you know, a, a whole round of thinking. And I think from you said even from the you know staff meetings, but also the reality-based issue. The, you know, let's think about this big time, but what does it mean? you know, to individual people. Um, it was, uh, I think, I don't know, maybe not just an interesting era. I think it was the people. And maybe we don't know the, the new Eric Rofus. We don't, maybe we don't know who that is. And maybe there are other people, you know, coming up. Or maybe we're just so damn busy we don't have these kinds <laughs> you know, of conversations. That is part of the problem of this era. Mollified by whatever, <laughs> CSI. <laughs> <laughs> Which is choose, on 24 hours choose, a day, from what I can tell. Choose your drug. Right. Okay. Choose, choose your drug. Your drug. Right. Choose your drug. Tori talked about the, the the possible change in the political climate in the future. What I'm fearful of that that what will happen is that we'll exchange a right wing conservative narrow no, political climate for. Now, a different political climate that's a Democratic, you know, as opposed to a Republican, if you use partisan politics, but it'll still be narrow. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's what we have to be careful about, that what worked before is that we fundamentally behaved and believed that we were different, you know, and that that impacted who and what and how we did things. It wasn't just you know, what outcomes we wanted. Now, and I'm fearful, you know, particularly now that we talk about political change, that we'll exchange you know, a narrow you know, Republican point of view you know, for a narrow Democratic point of view. Well, well it's, a, it's a lot. Before we get into that, I hate to say this, but we have only 30 seconds remaining. Okay. And I, you know, I, I, we have a show. We have another, we have another show, show on Absolutely. this, especially after that. the elections. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about Absolutely. elections. And you'll already know what happened. And... You know, we don't at the moment. But in the spirit of Eric Rofus, where we're talking about expansiveness and not mm. limiting, where we talk about integration and not sort of fractionalization, um, I think there are lessons to be learned. We could never sum up anybody's life, not on this show, not in a eulogy, not anywhere. But I think what Eric would want us to take away is that we are complicated, we are many-faceted, um, we should try to be integrated and just get used to it. 